Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I, I sense that the, the whole discussion about the uh, antimatter and negative energy solutions are uh, uh, somewhat confusing. So let me wrap up in a way that that's actually sort of unified among all kinds of fields we talked about. So what we did initially was the non relativistic solution. And the free part of the action is something you have seen a little while ago now. And we didn't discuss it this way, but now that we are talking about Heisenberg picture, so that we are treating time and, and space on equal footing, we can look at the little Lagrange equation here. And the solution to this is really this plane A. which we are familiar with from quantum mechanics because the same equation as the single particle uh, the Schrodinger equation. Of course, we have now a different meaning for psi being an annihilation operator. But now that if you look at the solution to this Euler-Lagrange equation, then all we are doing in the moment is to write C as a function of x and t, because it's Heisenberg symmetry given to t, as a linear superposition of all these solutions. And bring in a coefficient of this solution to be an operator. And for the Schrodinger field, you don't have a solution whose energy is negative because this is E equal to P squared over 2M. So energy is only positive here. So you don't have another solution with the opposite sign here. And that's why there's only one type of operator you need to introduce. And that turns out to be the annihilation operator. So with this normalization, it satisfies This delta function normalization. So the idea of this mode expansion is always that you first look at equation motion or Euler Grange equation, you find a solution to it for a given momentum, and you expand the field as a linear superposition of the solutions for each momentum, but this has to be an operator, so it needs to have an operator coefficient. And that operator coefficient turns out to be the annihilation operator. So in retrospect, this is what we did with the Schrodinger model. Now, if you put it this way, you can see immediately that what we are doing with the complex time order field is the same. And also directly. So in this case, we have the action. And this is now Lorentz invariant. And we made sure that this field satisfies the time order equation. And the simple solution to this is again a plain wave where energy is given by cp squared plus mc squared squared minus px. So that's one type of solution. And we call this positive frequency solution. But because this is basically e squared minus p squared minus mc squared squared. This is quadratic dt. So you also find a solution where frequency is negative.
Um, you can immediately see that this is called negative frequency solution. And the more expansion we did for the field in Heisenberg vector, is again expand the field in linear superposition of all solutions you have. So for simplicity, let me call this E, the same way handwriting. And for this positive frequency solution, you introduce an ideation operator. And now that there is also this negative energy, negative frequency solution, we introduce another set of operators. And that's indeed what we did. And so the, for the positive frequency solution, you associate an ideation operator. For the negative energy solution, you associate the, the creation operator for the antiparticle. And that is what gave us the consistent quantization of the Klein Gordon field. So the only difference from the Schrodinger field is that now there are two kinds of solutions positive frequency, negative frequency. For the non relativity Schrodinger field, we had only positive frequency solution. So we needed only an addition operator for the mode expansion of the field. But now that the Klein Gordon equation allows for both positive frequency and negative energy uh, solutions, we need to actually expand the field in both of them as a linear superposition, just like the t-shirt of Jackie. You need to have a linear superposition of uh, two different things over there. And for the positive frequency solution, you associate an addition operator. For the negative energy solution, you associate a uh, creation operator. So this line is new because relativistic field equation allows for negative frequency solution that didn't exist for uh, the non relativistic Schrodinger field. And there's some difference in the normalization because we want to make, make sure it's, it's a normalized invariant. So we chose the normalization that is not only 2 pi h but q, but there's a 2 p factor. So that this combination is normalized invariant. But that's a small detail. Uh, so other than that, the idea is the same. Once you have the field in Heidelberg vector, you solve the field equation, find solutions, expand the field at the linear superposition of those solutions, and the coefficients turn out to be creation addition operators. And when there is both positive frequency and negative frequency solutions, you associate an addition operator for the positive frequency solution, creation operator for the negative frequency solution, and then everything works out. Now, putting it this way, I hope you see that what we have done with one field is also the same. That gradient comes with this Dirac Hamiltonian we talked about. And this P is really meant to be the relative operator. So, Euler Lagrange equation uh, of uh, this, this, and we will come up with a more, you know, uh, Lorentz invariant looking notation later on. But anyway, this is the equation we've been solving, and we have two kinds of solution. One of them is the positive energy solution. With two different velocities. And negative energy solution, again, for two different velocities. And when we talk about the whole of absence of the negative energy solution, it might have been confusing. But after all the dust, dust settled, in the end, all we have to do
Tem que ter esse rede forte. Instead of talking about positive evidence and negative evidence, it's because we decided to abandon the idea of single particle quantum mechanics and now that we are dealing with the field theory, this is now a positive frequency solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation. And then you associate annihilation operators to it. And for the negative frequency solution, you associate creation operator to it. And indeed, we have already verified that this gives us the ground state, which is annihilated by the both annihilation operators for particle and antiparticle. You can define states with the particles and antiparticles in them. And everything makes sense. So we went sort of the roundabout historical way of deriving this mode expansion by saying that this is supposed to be the absence of negative energy solution, therefore it is the whole. We had an experience dealing with a hole in the case of the non relativistic like a Fermi gas. So we knew we were supposed to exchange an addition operator by the creation operator. That's why we put the creation operator here. But after all the dust samples, we are doing is exactly the same as what we have done with the klein gordon field. Because the relativistic field equation allows for both positive frequency and negative frequency solutions, we always deal with the positive frequency solution together with the annihilation operators. The only complication is the solution is this four-dimensional vector. But otherwise, this is just meant to be a solution to the Dirac equation. For the klein gordon equation, there was only one component, so we didn't have this vector structure to it. But it, the concept is the same thing. You were just solving the euler lagrange equation. And for the solution of the lagrange equation, then you have an addition operator associated with the positive frequency solution and creation operator associated with the negative frequency solution. And that's it. And to put everything in context, let me also talk about the Maxwell field. All right, noise. And we have this action. And we also introduce this word a bit notation that a mu four vector is scalar potential over C and the vector potential F mu nu is a four-dimensional coral using this we could be writing in a manifestly Lorentz invariant fashion. And it satisfies the Maxwell's equation. And solution to that is this solution where C is C. And also, we have a negative frequency solution. But given that we are talking about this full component vector potential, it comes with a polarization vector. So this is actually very much the same thing as what we are doing with the Dirac equation, because the field equation turns out to have multiple components. Therefore, solution to the euler lagrange equation also have multiple components. So in that Dirac, case of Dirac field, you have to deal with this four-dimensional vector. In the same way, for vector potential in electromagnetism, when you solve for the Maxwell's equation, you are solving for the vector potential. And therefore, it comes with a polarization vector. This is the same idea as the U and V solutions for Dirac equation, conceptually. And we know what epsilons are. You have worked it out in the Coulomb gauge. 
then you even use them to compute the, 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 the annihilation and decay rates of the two B states, one D state, one S state. But it's the same idea. And using, using those solutions, and wait, I, I need to do a bit of the normalization again. H bar over epsilon naught to one F. And we expand the uh, vector potential with a positive energy solution or positive frequency solution rather, which is associated with annihilation operator. And we have two such polarization vectors. And we have also negative frequency solutions. And negative frequency solutions for the circular polarization was a complex conjugate of that. And for the negative frequency solution, we associate creation operator. But photon is an antiparticle for its own. AU is a permission field. To make sure that expression is permission, this has to be actually the dagger of annihilation operator here. That's the situation we didn't really have for the dual field because the electron and positron are definitely distinct. They have different electric charges. So that's why we had a two different annihilation creation operators. But in the case of photon, this is a co emission field. Therefore, this co emission conjugate must be that one. And therefore, this annihilation operator conjugate must be the creation operator over here. So we don't have a separate B creation operator. We use the same A operator, uh, creation operator here, annihilation operator here. But you see, it's the same idea. Once again, we have the field equation, which is nothing but the Maxwell equation. And for the Maxwell equation, we have both positive frequency and negative frequency solutions. And because the vector potential has four components to it, each solution comes together with its polarization vector. And then we do the mode expansion of the, the, uh, the vector potential in terms of both positive frequency and negative frequency solutions. And for the positive frequency, we associate annihilation operator. For negative frequency solution, we associate a creation operator. And there's an extra requirement that AMU is real or permission. And that forces us to use the same operator here and there. Uh, but otherwise, it's the same idea. And that is also true when you go to real phi and zero. In that case, phi and phi dagger are the same. And for the purpose of getting correct normalization, you need to put one half here in that case, when you don't have a dagger. But it gives you the same phi Gordon equation. Therefore, same set of positive frequency and negative frequency solutions. So you have an ideation operator associated with the positive frequency solution. But if the klein Gordon field is real, it's the same D as the photon. We need to make sure that the permission conjugate of this term is the other term. And that forces this B to be the same as A. And that will be very much analogous to what we have just talked about in the case of Maxwell field. So if we actually put it this way, what we are doing is always the same. You first go to Heisenberg picture, and that's not what we were used to do back in quantum mechanics class. That's why we started dealing with the Schrodinger field in the Schrodinger picture at the very beginning. But now that we got used to deal with the field in Heisenberg picture, then the field operator depends both space on time and satisfy the Euler Lagrange equation. And once you know the Euler Lagrange equation, you just go ahead and solve it and expand your field as a linear superposition of those solutions. For the Schrodinger field, there was only positive frequency solution, so we needed to associate with only with an addition operator. But now in retrospect, that was actually a rather special situation because we're dealing with a non-relativistic system. Once you deal with the relativistic quantum field theory, there are always positive energy solutions and negative energy solutions. And whenever there's a negative energy solution, in the field of mode expansion, you uh, associate 
the uh, annihilation operator to it, and, and it is spoke. I shouldn't have positive energy, as this is a positive frequency solution. And for the negative frequency solution, you associate the creation operator. And there may be some conservation about the permittivity. There may be some conservation about multiple components. But they all belong to the same idea of solving the field equation, expand the field in terms of solutions, annihilation operator for positive frequency solution, creation operator for the negative energy uh, sorry, uh, frequency solutions. So, the, so after all the dust settles concerning all these discussions about holes, this is actually following exactly the same idea as what we have done with the other fields as well. So I hope this actually gives you a much better sense of what's going on. So in some sense, you can all forget about the, all this stuff about the negative internal solution you might have to grapple with. Now that we decided that Dirac equation is the field equation instead of single particle quantum mechanics, we are just following exactly the same rules. And you can forget about the fact that this used to be called negative energy solution. This used to be about a hole, but now you don't need to remember all of this because I'm just following the same discussion as I would do for the complex van Gogh's equation. There's no difference between them. So I hope this clarifies some of the confusions there might have been there. Any questions about this? I'm yes. Um, oh, Alessandro? Yes. You look different. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, anyway, my question is, maybe because I don't have a mask, but anyway, uh, maybe that. Anyway, my question is that in the Schrodinger field, the, um, the phi at the end, that is an operator, right? Right. Okay. Is it the same case for like yeah, also in, the, in the direct field? Yes, like, the phi an operator. And it's the annihilation operator, right? I'm sorry? It's the annihilation operator. No, it's, it, it contains both annihilation and creation operator. Oh, sorry, annihilation, annihilation. Uh, and photon field also has both, both of them, right? Okay. That's why you could actually use this to create a photon uh, from the decay of the 2p state. You need, really needed this creation operator for that purpose. So my question, I guess, is what does then do like our solution, our final solution when we apply like, there is an operator, so when we apply like a state to it, what does it do? Um, so if, if you apply, for example, psi on the vacuum state, clearly the first line vanishes because that's an addition operator that would annihilate the vacuum state, but second line doesn't, so you end up creating an antiparticle state by popping from with the superposition in momentum. And that's what we did with the photon too. When you have this uh, single particle <coughs> and Newtonian or point particle, you have this A field edit. And when you acted this on the 2P state of hydrogen atom, because A contains the creation operator, that allowed us to create a photon from 2p state, going to one state plus the photon. So we actually use the fact that field operator contains the creation operator. And we will be actually using this Dirac field in developing perturbation theory soon. We derive what is called the Feynman rules. And with that, you can compute process like electron and positron can annihilate and that you go to intermediate state of photon, and that photon in turn creates different particle species like muon. And in order to compute this process, you actually do need to rely on the fact that field operator contains both annihilation operator for the particle and creation operator for the antiparticle. So psi operator would uh, uh, annihilate the electron, Psi dagger operator would annihilate the positron, so they disappear from the universe, turn into a virtual photon at an intermediate state. Then you use different Dirac fields for the muon, and field operator can then create the anti muon. Field operator dagger can create a muon. So you can have this process like pair annihilation of the particles a pair creation of the particles, and indeed this is seen in experiments. 
So that's the kind of process you will never be able to talk about in quantum mechanics because some particle just totally disappears. And different uh, particles uh, uh, totally uh, 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 all of a sudden appears. So your Schrodinger equation wouldn't allow you to remove a particle or create a particle, but in quantum field theory, this happens routinely because you know everything is now written in terms of creation addition operators. And to describe a process like this one, you really do need to have both an addition operator and creation operator in a single field. And you will see that explicitly uh, uh, next week. Then my next question would be, then reality is always like filled with this electron and non like field, direct field? So the re you said reality? Yes, like our, like our world, our reality. Oh, the reality in the sense of yes, the reality yes, of yes, the yes, world. Yeah, that's yes. right, yeah. So I, I thought you were talking the reality of the field. No, no, no. So then you have to no, no, no. make it automatically part of the same. Okay. Ryan? Um, so our standard process of making a field, like, um, get a new QFT is just kind of like solving the EL equation mm -hmm. and then expand that into modes, right? Right. But if the EL equation itself is not linear, then we That's an excellent have... question. So uh, we have talked about nonlinear field equation before when we talked about both and condensate and superconductivity. And so in that case, you have to really solve the nonlinear equation and uh, we have some solutions to it and we actually use them for the both and condensate. But what we do next is develop perturbation theory to describe this interaction of the relativistic particles and photons. That's the quantum electrodynamics. And as far as the, we are dealing with the perturbation theory, you are separating the free part of the Hamiltonian and interaction. And interaction comes with fine structure constant. So when you have the free part and the interaction part, you can use interaction picture. And if you remember in the interaction picture, operators evolve only according to the free part of the Hamiltonian. So even in the presence of interaction, field operators still follow the free Hamiltonian. Therefore, they still satisfy the free euler lagrange equation without interactions in it. So the field expansion we have done is still valid because the field operators still satisfy free equation motion, free euler lagrange equation without interactions with it. So with interaction, of course, the true Heisenberg equation of motion will be nonlinear, and typically we can solve that. But thanks to the fact that we are in, the, in, in between Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture, we do the separation of Hamiltonian into two parts. And in the interaction picture, the field operators evolve according to the free Hamiltonian. Therefore, they still satisfy the free Euler Lagrange equation which is linear by definition, being free. Therefore, you can solve them. You can do the mode expansion. And everything we are doing here turns out to carry over, even in the presence of the interaction, as long as you stick to the perturbation theory. Yes, right. Um, then, um, say, if we consider gravity, uh -huh. then even without the presence of matter, the field equation itself is still linear then in that case how can we get the a free yeah that's curve? an excellent question then of course things become a little bit difficult suppose you are living near the black hole then your electromagnetic field has to propagate in the presence of the Schwarzschild metric and the solution becomes complicated but it's still a linear equation so in principle you can solve it maybe not analytically in, in, in depending on what the background is but at least numerically, you can solve for the solutions. In a case of short uh, metric, actually, you can even solve uh, analytically the, the solutions to the, uh, the mode expansion, it turns out. So then you just write out this mode expansion using the solution in that space time background, then associate an addition operator for the positive frequency solutions, and you also obtain negative frequency solutions in that space-time background and associate equation and operator for those solutions and do a similar mode expansion. And that's not just uh, the, the case with the, um, uh, 
um, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the coupling to gravity. For example, if you think about this Dirac electron in a hydrogen atom, then you want to put a coulomb potential on top of it. Then my field, the, the Euler Lagrange equation changes. But this is still linear. It's more complicated. But in this case, you can still have analytic solution to this equation. Then you expand the field operator in gaining a superposition of positive frequency solutions and negative frequency solutions. Positive frequency solutions in this case turns out to contain the continuum where energy is above mc squared and also discrete states which correspond to the bound state whose energy is slightly below mc squared so when energy is bigger than mc squared that's a continuum not bound states when energy is mc squared basically minus They correspond to the bound space, and this is discrete. You also have a solution below minus mc squared. That's a continuum, which corresponds to positron, because positron does not get bound to proton. They repel instead of attract each other because they have the same charges. You don't have bound state. That's why there is no discrete states. They're only continuum. So your field expansion then turns out to be sum over the continuum of the positive frequency solutions and sum over discrete set of states. They are also positive uh, 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 frequency solutions. And then sum over all these negative frequency solutions for the continuum. So this mode expansion basically consists of three different kinds of pieces now. But idea is still the same. You solve the field equation which is linear, once you have the solutions, then you expand the field in terms of linear superposition of those solutions. And in this case, you have both continuum and discrete states for the positive energy solutions. But nonetheless, you associate annihilation operator for those positive frequency solutions. For negative frequency solutions, you have only the continuum, and you associate the creation operator for that. But the idea is the same. You expand the field in terms of the solutions to the free part of the theory, where free part in this case now includes the Coulomb potential. Just like near a black hole, you have to include the Schwarzschild metric in your field equation, but still the same idea. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, but what if, um, say, because that is the case that we are trying to expand another field near the near 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 the horizon. But if we are considering the um, the gravity itself, the the field associated to gravity, um, it's it's perhaps the, the metric. If yeah, so that, that becomes of course a, a difficult question because then the gravity or metric becomes an operator uh, instead of a classical uh, background metric. And I consider answers to the question to be above my pay grade. I'm not paid enough to answer questions about quantum gravity because I don't know anything about it. So I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> but that is, of course, a difficult situation. And uh, in the case of uh, you know, perturbation theory, though, you can always expand the space time metric as g mu nu from the flat Minkowski metric and perturbation to it. And once again, as long as you stick to perturbation theory, you deal with this unperturbed metric first, do the same thing I just talked about, and deal with this piece as a form of perturbation, then you can talk about scattering, for example, of the graviton and the Clyde Gordon field, if you like. So that perturbation theory still is possible. Okay, any other questions?
Yes. I was wondering if the people that developed this at first, they knew all the properties about the particles that they were trying to describe. So for example, in the last line, when you said that the photon is not its own anti-particle, uh, uh, anti uh -huh. uh, so like, uh, sorry, its own, its own anti-particle, uh, so that you justified your A and your A dagger using that argument, right? That's right. So right. did the people that initially do this, did they know that? Uh, in the case of photon, of course, we knew that electromagnetic field is real. So we knew that ahead of time from the classical electromagnetism. For the Dirac field, we didn't know a priori. Uh, but the, what Dirac tried, of course, is think of this as an electron. And then electron field really did, does need to have distinction between electron and positron because they have different electric charges. So then you learn that this field cannot be Hermitian. But there is a possibility that also Dirac field could be Hermitian. And I was going to talk about that in, in a few minutes, which is called Majorana field. And, and we don't know yet, but neutrino is a possible Majorana field. We don't know if that's true yet. It could be Dirac or Majorana. Whether neutrino and antineutrino are same particle, different particle, we are still trying to understand that experimentally. But theoretically, either way, it's possible. And that's one of the important questions in neutrino physics. And you might have also heard of Majorana fermion in the context of topological insulator in condensed matter physics. So you have this weird phenomenon that electrons in insulator somehow separate its degree of freedom of spin and charge. So electron can lose its charge and can become neutral, and then it can be the antiparticle of its own, then you call that Majorana fermion. And the charge got now separated, so you have a degree of freedom which could have a charge but no spin. So something weird can happen in condensed matter physics, and the, having marijuana fermion is regarded to be a very exciting thing because it will be extremely useful, let's say, for quantum computing in the end. So that's a very sort of hot subject in condensed matter physics. So both in the context of particle physics, where neutrino could be marijuana fermion. And in condensed matter physics, we think we, there should be no matter of a fermion. So either way, we would talk about a fermion field, spin one half, where a particle and antiparticle are identical. So we'll come back and talk about that. So that's an excellent question. Any other questions? OK, so I hope this sort of unified picture makes sense. All right. Uh, and yeah, that's right. And then we wanted to talk about Majorana and Fermion, and, but before going there, I'd like to briefly talk about also why. about this Dirac equation. I forgot H bar there. C. Oh, yes. Should that be a derivative instead of P? Ah, that's right. Sorry. Thank you. So this is the equation we, uh, that uh, the Dirac came up with. But compared to the kind of equation up there, which is manifestly going to be evident. Remember this box along the line is the four-dimensional Laplacian. And because the EDC is a contracted form between upstairs and downstairs, this is manifested already in the area. So this looks nice. This one doesn't look nice because they are treating space and time differently from each other. It turns out that this can be written in Lorentz invariant form just by multiplying it by this beta matrix on both sides of the equation. Then first of all, I find beta. 
Because theta what the matrix that looks like this. If you square it, one minus one squared is one. That's four-dimensional uh, the uh, identity matrix. So I don't write identity matrix here. And if you look at this way, you can combine them in the form of beta del t psi and del t is del zero times c because the uh, x zero is ct so when you write when I write del zero that derivative with respect to ct what I used to have is a type derivative so I have extra one over c in it so I compensate that by multiplying this c over here and then I have C beta alpha and I think I no no this is not this thing okay then using this expression I rewrite this as C times yam u tau u sub so here I have x0 derivative, that's part of this when mu is 0, and then this matrix beta is gamma naught. If you look at this expression here, it's a spatial derivative, so mu is now i, x, y is 0, 1, 2, 3, and the coefficient of that is gamma i, which I can identify as beta alpha i. And beta alpha i is 0 minus 1, 0 sigma i, sigma i. So you can just go ahead and do the algebra, and you'll find uh, 0 sigma i minus sigma i 0. That's gamma i. And when you introduce this new notation, I haven't changed any physics here, because the only thing I have done is to multiply this matrix on both sides of the Dirac equation. But by limiting this matrix beta now as gamma naught, beta alpha i as gamma i, I can now convert this Dirac equation into this form. Should it be plus then, mc squared instead? I'm sorry? Plus mc squared? Uh, this is plus? Because yes. it's minus minus. Ah, so I made a mistake here actually. So in the Dirac Hamiltonian, there was C alpha of E plus MC square beta. So this was plus, this is plus, and therefore this is minus, and this is minus. Thank you, Sam. So once you actually write it this way, then this new index is now summed over, one upstairs and one downstairs, then this is now manifestly Lorentz invariant. So this is now the notation we normally use. So the Dirac action doesn't look this complicated anymore. It is given by, again, I don't want to make a mistake about facts where H1 and C I never remember. Uh, so this turns out to be psi gamma beta i gamma mu del mu minus mc squared is h bar c. And there's one little thing which is ugly here, this psi dagger beta. So this is just yet another notation. I write this as psi bar. The same thing as gamma naught. And once you actually introduce this notation, then Lagrangian is now given by psi bar, this gamma mu del mu, mc squared m psi, and then looks much more, in some sense, beautiful. Uh, that, that's the Lorentz invariant notation. The only difference from what we have done is just change the notation, but this is the way we normally write Lagrangian for the Dirac field. 
So just a little notation here. Any questions about this? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So just by writing it this way and claiming that it's Lorentz invariance is a bit of cheating because we haven't verified that gamma mu really does transform as which one is a contravariant vector because it's upstairs and the Lorentz transformation. And I'm glossing over. So if you want to talk about Lorentz transformation, you also need to know how the Psi transforms the Lorentz transformation. And I was not planning to talk about it, but now that you asked, for that purpose, we need to introduce yet another combination of the gamma matrices, which is the commutator of two gamma matrices. And this sigma mu nu turns out to be the generator of Lorentz transformation. So Psi now transforms this one, where you exponentiate this matrix in, in, in the uh, exponent. And when you just look at the spatial components, gamma i, gamma j, then this is nothing but the big sigma matrix you have seen before. So that corresponds to spatial rotation, as you know from quantum mechanics, is given by sigma dot angle over 2. So this specializes to that form of the spatial rotation for spin one half when you actually do so. But you can also take one of these to be time component. Let's say you have gap sigma i uh, zero i, and that will correspond to the generator of the boost along the i direction. And then you have to put that in here, and then it's another unitary matrix, but nonetheless you can still work it out. Then that's how the Lorentz transformation works on this Dirac field. And once you have defined how the Lorentz transformation works, you can use this matrix and sandwich this gamma mu matrix from both sides to see how that transforms. And it turns out that gamma mu really does transform as a contravariant vector, just like x mu and p mu do. And once you verify that, because this is really does transform as a vector with the index upstairs, this is the derivative that's really the, uh, the index up downstairs. If you sum them up, then you find that this is Lorentz invariant. And I'm skipping that over, but you can verify that. Yes. So just like the sigmas had the physical meaning of spin, and the um, the h had the helicity. Yes. Is the gamma so, uh, anything physically? So gamma itself doesn't have the direct physical meaning, unfortunately. But if you have to look at the, uh, the, 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 the commutator I just mentioned between two spatial components. So this turns into minus 2i m from i j k sigma k sigma k. And this is the matrix you looked at as big sigma k, which was conserved together with all the regular momentum so that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. The definition of sigma matrix over there is 2 over i, so I need to multiply 2 over i everywhere. And that cancels minus i in 2. So that indeed is the sigma matrix by itself. So this way you know that sigma, which have the meaning of the spin, really does enter how the field transforms under spatial rotation. And that's something you knew from quantum mechanics, namely that e to the i j theta over h bar is a rotation operator. 
in the case of spin one half, this turns into Pauli matrices. And that's indeed exactly what you get when you use this gamma i gamma j looking into that expression. And so that's how you know that this really does have the meaning of spin. Thank you for the question. Any other questions here? OK, so this was just a notation thing. Now we come back to the geometric field. So we did work out explicit solutions to the Dirac equation. And now we know that they are meant to be how will you do the mode expansion with. And let me get back to those solutions. So we introduce these two components thing. Let me divide this again in those. And they have this property that they are eigenvalues, eigenspace of this equation with the Pauli matrices. So this is two by two matrix. This is two component. And we found the positive frequency solution. And we talked about the fact that if you're looking at the positive frequency solutions, this is a large component, this is a small component. And when you worked out the uh, G factor of the electron, you basically eliminated the small component in favor of the large component. And that expansion led to the uh, calculation of G factor that you must have gotten two. And for the negative energy solution, this is the large component, this, this is a small component. So you can do the similar uh, non relativistic uh, approximation with the positrons as well. But if you have a fermion whose mass is zero, this is the way we used to think the neutrinos are. We used to think the neutrinos don't have any mass. Then what you find is that this component, that component, basically have the same size. Also here, this component and that component have the same size. Then depending on the plus minus sign, you find that they are actually eigenstate of yet another gamma matrix called gamma phi. So when you have this plus sign here, gamma phi u plus is u plus because this only interchanges up by lower two components. And when you have a plus sign, that gives you plus sign. For u minus, there's a minus sign here, so this actually turns into minus. So you find that. And for v plus minus, we have gamma phi on it. For the plus helicity, you take the minus sign here, so that gives you minus. For the negative velocity, you take the plus sign here, so that's plus. So you find all of them are actually eigenstates of the gamma phi matrix. And there's one more thing I forgot about name, uh, uh, terminology. So when you're talking about the Dirac field, these are four component objects. So I call them vector to avoid confusion. But 
what the actual name is called spinner instead of vector because we're dealing with something with spin. So the way we say it is that positive energy spinners in the massless limit become eigen spinners of gamma phi, and so do the negative energy spinners. They are also eigen spinners of gamma phi. And with gamma phi positive, you have u plus and b minus. For gamma phi negative, you have u minus and b plus. So what that means is that for the massless fermions, we have the grouping using this eigenvalue of the gamma phi, which corresponds to u plus namely you have particle with a positive velocity and B minus you have an antiparticle with a negative velocity for gamma 5 minus 1 uh, sorry with B minus I have U minus which is a particle with a negative velocity and B plus which is an antiparticle with a positive velocity And gamma phi also commutes with the Hamiltonian because Hamiltonian now doesn't have the mass in it. And if you look at the gamma phi alpha commutator, gamma phi alpha commutator is one one sigma sigma minus sigma sigma one one and this one is sigma sigma so is this one so it vanishes therefore gamma phi is conserved And that kind of makes sense because once the particle is massless, and if you have the spin orientation which is positive velocity, because it's massless, you can never stop it and let it move backwards. If you were able to do so, then positive energy spinner can turn into negative energy spinner. So if this is not going at speed of light, you guys can run faster than that and look back, and particles moving backwards, then you find the spin is anti-parallel to its motion, then it's negative velocity. Namely that if you have positive energy, positive velocity particle, you should also have negative velocity particle because that de depends on the reference frame. On the other hand, when the particle is massless, you can never overtake it. You can never stop it. So if you have a positive energy fermion, it is positive, uh, positive uh, velocity fermion, it is positive velocity in all reference frames, if it's massless. So it turns out, in the case of neutrino in the standard model particle physics, you don't have them. And you have only these. And experimentally, it is known that neutrino that comes out of the nuclear beta decay is always the end negative velocity. And if you look at the nuclear, uh, the beta plus decay, then you find anti neutrinos, and they're always velocity positive. You don't have these things, at least nobody has seen them. And as long as neutrino is massless, that's not a problem because the helicity is reference frame independent as I told you. So that's totally okay. So this is what is called the wild fermion. In the case of massless,
straight one half vertical. What we used to have for the Dirac fermion is two spin orientations of particles, two spin orientations of antiparticles. You have four states all together. But you don't need to have all four of them if it's massless. You could do with only a half of it. In this case, negative Felicity neutrino and positive Felicity unsigned neutrino. And this is also consistent with the CPT theorem we talked about. That means that if you do CT and T all at once, physics should remain unchanged. So if you start with neutrino with a negative felicity, then you first do T. And under time reversal or reversal of motion, which is the name J.J. Sakurai prefers in his quantum mechanics textbook, I think that's a better name indeed because you can never reverse time. But you can reverse the motion, then momentum flips. But spin, spinning motion, also reverses. And so this is a neutrino. Still with a negative velocity. So we know this thing exists. This state exists too. But next, we have to do parity. When you do parity, momentum reverses, but the spin doesn't. This will be a neutrino with positive velocity, which doesn't exist. But that's OK, because the theorem tells us you have to do C, P, and T all at once. We haven't done charge conjugation yet. Charge conjugation is an operation that interchanges particles and antiparticles. It doesn't change momentum or spin, but just changes neutrino to antineutrino. And this particle does exist. So having only half of them, doesn't contradict with the CPT theorem. But as we just did saw, when you do parity, you turn an existing state to a non-existing state. This violates parity. But that's something we know. Weak interaction, which emits neutrino from the nuclear beta decay, is parity violating. So nature does not respect parity as its symmetry, but having this half degree of freedom for neutrino is still consistent with the CPT theorem. It violates parity. It also violates charge conjugation, but CPT altogether is still respected. So this is the way we used to think. Neutrino is always left-handed, negative velocity. Anti-neutrino is always positive velocity, right-handed. We don't have right-handed neutrino or left-handed anti-neutrino that violates parity, but still respect the CPT theorem. And it's a consistent with the realistic quantum field theory. And in terms of the field, what you're supposed to do then is to put the actual requirement that gamma phi has an eigenvalue minus one. And what we discussed on this board here is that once you actually make this requirement, the gamma phi has a negative eigenvalue, you have only u minus sp plus. Because those are the spinners, eigenspinners of gamma phi, with eigenvalues minus one. So this is a constraint we can impose on the spinner field. 
so that you can only have degree of freedom, which seems to be that what neutrinos are in nature. And this kind of degree of freedom is called the wire fermion. And wire fermion also shows up in condensed matter physics when you have a system which is, doesn't restrict parity. Uh, most crystals do restrict parity, but if you actually put some pressure on it, and the lattice can get distorted in a way that that may not restrict parity, then you could have parity violating spectrum of excitation. And the wire fermion is known to appear in some of these uh, both Dirac material. And so the, these things also exist in condensed matter physics as well. So the idea here is that you can have only half degree of freedom compared to a Dirac particle. And this is the way we used to describe neutrino in the standard model. So any questions about biofermion? Uh, Let's go ahead. Uh, the question is, uh, if, we, uh, if, you know, if we have the massless neutrino hmm? not an instant system, but if you have you know, a neutrino of mass, let's say uh, the same type of the world, we can overpass the neutrino. That's right. And because the left-hand neutrino must have a very small mass, hmm. but the right-hand neutrino must have a very big mass, then if you overpass the neutrino, then it, its mass is not converting. So that's an excellent question. So that's actually the next thing I was getting to. So, so this was okay in the happy world that before 1998, when we didn't know the neutrino had a mass. And everything was consistent in the standard model particle physics. But in 1998, it was discovered that neutrino actually does have small but finite mass. Then you can overtake the neutrino because it's not going with speed of light. Then the notion of physicity is now reference frame dependent. So this idea of claiming neutrino as the wild fermion no longer works. So we have to somehow fix it. The standard model particle physics is not right anymore. The question is, what is the right way to fix it? And there are two options, and we don't know which one is right. So, so then, then we, I, I try to answer Yuten's question out of this slide. But before getting into that, is any questions about the white fermion uh, by itself? Yes? So would it also uh, disprove the white fermion if we have CP violations? Ah, yeah, so there could be also CP violation. So uh, I talked about the fact that in some systems, T is violated. I talked about this weird phenomenon that K1, which is made of down quark and anti strange quark, and anti K1, which is made of strange quark and anti down quark, can actually turn into each other. They actually oscillate. And the probability of this one going to that one, and probability of this one going to that one, is different. And therefore, it violates time reversal. So T is known to be violated. What it means then is that because CPT still has to be a symmetry of the relativistic quantum field theory, that's the theorem, if T is not respected, C times T must also be not respected in such a way that they compensate each other to keep the product still a symmetry. So before getting to CP violation, let's look at this neutrino first. And when you do parity, you go from existing state to non-existing state. So that's bad. That's not a symmetry of nature. But when parity was broken, then people got so shocked because we always used to think that parity was some, something sacred. That's the symmetry of the nature. Nothing this, this thing is so therefore right. But now parity is violated. People want to cling to something that is still OK, namely P times C. When you do parity, you go from existent to non-existent. But if you do C at the same time, you come back to something that exists. So people hope that CP was still a symmetry. So once parity is violated, people hope that CP and T are both symmetries of nature. And for a while, it was OK. But later on, we discovered the CP is violated. T is also violated. And this is discovered only in year 2000, so much more recent. But it turns out the CPT is still a symmetry of the nature. So 
there is a possibility that the neutrinos could violate CP as well. And that's actually a billion dollar question. So there's an experiment being built at Fermilab called DUNE, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, whose purpose is to look for the question whether CP is violated among neutrinos. And there's a, an experiment going on in Japan at, at, at right now, actually, called P2K, which has a hint of CP violation neutrinos at two sigma level. But as you all know, when you claim discovery in physics, you typically require five sigma, so it's not quite there yet. So the, they are also upgrading their detector from super chemical candy, which is uh, 50 kiloton, to hyper chemical candy, which is 600 kiloton. So it's a huge monster experiment, but that's a competition that's going to happen in the near future. So whether CP is finally neutral or not is truly billion dollar questions. And there's a lot of effort being made to understand, answer this question in the near future. Okay, more questions. Is Juno also studying CP violation? I'm sorry? Is Juno also studying CP violation? Uh, Juno will not see CP violation, right? So uh, Juno would actually study neutrinos coming from the nuclear power plant. And in their experiment, by design, you are only looking for neutrinos going into something else. And so you are not actually detecting uh, final states. Then you cannot pick up CP violation from that. OK, any other questions? Yes, Jackie. Why, why, why is it P persistent? I'm sorry? The, uh, uh, it doesn't flip the spin. It doesn't flip the spin. Uh, if you think of, for example, the orbital angular momentum, that becomes clear because under parity, x goes to minus x, p goes to minus p, so l goes to l. It doesn't change, right? So the angular momentum in general is what is called axial vector rather than vector, and under parity, the, it doesn't change the sign. Any other questions? Okay, so this was the happy world of massless neutrinos, but now we have not. So what happened in 1998 is a report of this experiment. So here is our planet, and it is a super chemical detector, 50 kiloton, a big water tank. And what they can do is detect neutrinos. And one source of neutrinos is called atmospheric neutrinos. And as the name suggests, it originates from the atmosphere. So our planet is being bombarded by cosmic rays all the time, mostly proper, some helium, and there could be some other heavy nuclear as well, but it's mostly proper. And when quantum comes to our planet, at an altitude of about 20 kilometers or so, they hit oxygen or nitrogen nuclei and causes some reaction. So this is, let's say, uh, the nitrogen in, there's a proton, there's some reaction. And as I talked about in this Bermatron experiment up on the hill, it can eventually create a bunch of particles and ions. And these pions are known to decay into muon and a neutrino. And muon also known to decay into neutrino as well. So in the end, you produce two kinds of neutrinos. One of them is called the muon neutrino, which is created only together with the muon. An electron neutrino, which is always created together with the electron. The point here is that cosmic rays reach us in a random fashion. The cosmic rays are believed to be produced by uh, the stars that exploded a long time ago. And we briefly talked about supernova explosion. 
in the context of boats and all the case of both Einstein and condensate. And when the star explodes, it just blows a lot of material away from it. And those material can also hit gas between stars called interstellar medium. And that is basically six pocket experiments. Supernova plays the role of an accelerator by spinning out high energy protons. And intermediate interstellar medium uh, plays the role of a target. And when they when the uh, protons from the supernova hit the uh, nucleus of the interstellar medium, that's a fixed target experiment, just like this one. And, and so that is the way you can produce a bunch of particles. And those high energy protons wander about in a galaxy. But galaxy has a randomly oriented magnetic field from individual stars. The magnetic field would bend any charged particle. So eventually, the proton loses its memory of where it came from. So when they reach our atmosphere, they pretty much come randomly from all directions. Having said that, when you have this cross current coming in, produces some collision in the atmosphere, and produces neutrino coming into this experiment, you define a parameter for the zany temple, which is the angle of neutrino what are things to Z? So that's a zany temple. But if you can detect a neutrino coming with a zany tangle failure, you should be able to detect a neutrino coming from the zany tangle I minus theta. And because the cosmic wave comes randomly from all directions, if this reaction is possible, this reaction is also possible. And because Earth is, a, to a good approximation, it's a sphere, then on time and theta angle, you have exactly the same angle of theta over here. So what could have happened on this side of the Earth can also happen on the other side of the Earth with exactly the same rate. So as a result, we expect the distribution of neutrino events as a function of cosine theta. Cosine theta one means they come from straight up. Cosine theta minus one means the neutrons are produced on the other side of the Earth and just punch through the entire Earth without any problems because they are so weakly interacting. And you expect up-down symmetry. Because what can happen here is also possible over here. And so you expect the same number of neutrinos coming from above and below. And when, you, when the uh, superchemical experiment actually measured that, indeed, they found the same number of events coming from above and below. So this is beautifully up down symmetric, specifically for the electron type neutrino. But when they observe muon type neutrino, the expectation is up-down symmetric, shown in this histogram in shades. But data points over here, you basically detect same number of events as expected for those coming from above. But those produced on the other side of the planet, you see only about a half of them. So half of the neutrinos got lost somehow in the past itself. So in the case of the mu one neutrino, Compared to the expectations like this one, what they have seen is something like this. And it's only a half of those coming from the other side of the planet. So what does it mean? And it wasn't immediately clear, but again, after all the dust settled, we came to the conclusion that the neutrinos somehow change from one type to another. And that is called the neutrino oscillation. And standard model particle physics have what is called the three generations. You have groups of particles called leptons and quarks. For electron, there is an accompanying neutrino called Electron neutrino, mu one, mu one neutrino, and there's a sort of big brother of them called tau, and for that we have tau neutrino. 
and we also have six quarks up, down, straight, charm, bottom, up. And we're not going to talk about quarks for now. But the point here is that you have these three neutrino species, E, mu, and tau. And what we now know is that if you look at the new muon neutrino, something that started out with 100% muon neutrino, it actually starts to oscillate into tau neutrino and come back and go there and back. And this is what is called a neutrino oscillation. I have to finish uh, soon. And if this is the case, basically that the neutrino just turns into something else on its own while it is traveling from the other side of the planet. And when you're looking at the neutrons coming from above, distance is not very much, so there's not enough time for neutrinos to start turning to something else. But those from coming from the other side of the planet, there was a plenty of time for the muon neutrino to turn into tau neutrino. But they start to oscillate so much that eventually get averaged out, then it becomes about 50%. And near the horizon is a transition from no oscillation at all to full oscillation of 50%. And that's how you can understand this data which means that neutrino didn't have time to oscillate when they come from above, but they had enough time to oscillate when they come from below, which means the neutrino sense time. But as we talked about in brief review relativity, proper time is smaller than the time in the lab frame by square root of one and a beta squared. When the particle is massless, it's going to a speed of light, and beta is one. This is zero. So for massless particles that always speed of light, the time stops. Photon would not sense time. Time would never pass for a photon, which is traveling the speed of light. So if neutrino were massless, neutrino should not sense time either, but it did. It knew that there wasn't much time coming from above, but there was enough time coming from below. So neutrinos do sense time, which is only possible when it's not going with the speed of light. And therefore, it should have mass. So that's how we discovered neutrino mass. And after that, I was also involved in an experiment myself that using power plants, uh, we can actually, we see a lot of neutrinos that are produced from nuclear power plants. And by looking at the energy, we can measure the proper time. And neutrinos produced 100% start to disappear and reappear, disappear, reappear. And we could actually detect these two cycles of oscillations uh, in the real data. It's called Kamala's experiment. And, uh, and of course, uh, because of the resolution, it gets smeared out a little bit, but nonetheless, I think you can see this uh, clear oscillatory pattern of neutrinos, and so I was very really happy to be part of that experiment myself. But now, why do we know this way neutrinos really do oscillate, that this is the correct interpretation of this data back in 98? Uh, do we know why they oscillate? Yeah, so I can talk about it, but I'd like to finish up this oh, story. Sure. So let's postpone the question to next week. But anyway, now that we know neutrons have a mass, this whole idea of white fermion all of a sudden doesn't make sense anymore. Because you can overtake neutrinos, it's not going to be field of light, then the helicity is now frame dependent. And so we have to then change the theory somehow. And that's where we have an option. Simplest change you may think of is that, well, maybe it was wrong to have only half a degree of freedom. Maybe we have to go back to the full, divide four degree of freedom, then we have right at the neutrino, which nobody has seen before, but it should exist. That's an idea called Dirac 
but it's not going to the speed of light, you can overtake it, then it's moving backwards. So it's moving backwards now with the same spin, then this is right-handed, which nobody has seen before. But then you can remember, well, wait a second. We have seen right-handed neutral fermion before. That's unlikely. So another possibility is that if you overtake a neutrino, and look back at it, you find a right-handed neutral fermion, which is anti neutrino Namely that if you pass neutrino and look back, what you find is an anti neutrino there, which sounds crazy because they are antiparticles of each other. But if you remember photon, antiparticle photon is a photon. And that's okay because it's electrically neutral. Perhaps neutrino is the same way. If you take neutrino and think about this antiparticle, both of them are electrically neutral, so it could be the same particle. The thing is that we have never seen a matter particle being the same as antimatter particle. For the case of photon, we kind of used to it, but for matter particles, we have never seen matter and antimatter being the same. But nonetheless, it's a theoretical possibility, which is called the Majorana. Fermion. So what we'll do next week is how do we describe my real fermion using the Dirac equation and then talk about how we may ever know if the neutrino is Dirac or Majorana. So that's the question we will talk about next. And after that, we put everything together and build quantum electrodynamics and start looking at some new phenomena which wasn't possible to discuss in quantum mechanics. Uh, using the quantum electrodynamics, and that will be the end of this course. Okay? Sorry, I went over time. Any questions? Yes? Um, so you say that we have seen um, neutrinos with positive helicity, right. and anti-neutrino with positive helicity. Right, so this one we have never seen used uh -huh. with positive helicity. But we have seen anti-neutrinos. So my, my question is, how can we distinguish between neutrino and anti-neutrino? Uh, that's an excellent question. So you can distinguish them only when they both have reaction. So when neutrino hits the nucleus, it can turn into electron. When anti-neutrino reacts with the nucleus, it can turn into positron, for instance. So when neutrino and anti-neutrino causes a reaction, whether it turns into matter particle or antimatter particle, tells you whether you're talking about neutrino or anti-neutrino. So that's the way you can distinguish them. So but then in that case, what do you mean by um, they are the same particle? Yeah, so we will, we will talk about that next week. Okay? okay. Right? Any other questions? Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you.